if you're paying attention every single week, the Holy Spirit is saying the same thing. We're just the ones that are hard-headed. We don't get it. We have ears, but we don't listen. We have eyes, but we're not really seeing. I pray that changes for you. I pray that changes for you. Every single week, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He wants to teach you, show you a better way to live. And it really is that simple. We're the ones that overcomplicate it. Trust Jesus, follow him, and obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. We're not called to be hearers of the word. We're called to be doers of the word. The majority of us, we don't need more information. We need to apply what God has already said, spoken, and written. And simply submit. Maturity is not how much you know. Maturity is obedience. Yes, sir. Maturity is not how much you know. Maturity is obedience. It's one thing to follow Jesus. But do you believe in Jesus? There are a lot of people in the world today that are not against the teachings of Christ. Just because you have Christian ethics and morals does not mean that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, Son of the living God, Savior of the world, Lord of all. Do you believe who Jesus is? Many people believe that he was a good man, a great teacher, an inspirational leader, a prophet even, a political figure, extremely controversial. What do you believe about Jesus? Who do you say that he is because it's possible to be in this room it's possible to be following Jesus and you don't actually believe in him last week we talked about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus Jesus raises from the dead and he meets them on that road walks with them talks with them brings them through the Old Testament and reveals to them all that was spoken about Jesus in the Old Testament. He goes to their home, shares a meal with them, and finally they get the revelation of who Jesus is. It's possible to be going to crew. It's possible to be serving. It's possible to be coming every single Sunday, and you haven't gotten a revelation of who Jesus is. And I mean personally. Personally, who is Jesus to you? There's something about a personal experience that brings perspective, that brings clarity that brings a deeper conviction in what it is that you believe. The Bible goes on to say it this way, taste and see that the Lord is good in the book of Psalms. Taste and see. In other words, experience. See for yourself. Search. Look. 
Ask questions, cry, get frustrated, be honest before God. Wrestle with him. He wants a relationship with you. And if relationships with other human beings don't come easy, why do you think your relationship with God is going to come easy? Relationships with other people grow over time. It's the same exact thing with God. So we pick up in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 35. So the disciples who were on the road to Emmaus, they go back to Jerusalem and they meet up with the other followers of Jesus. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them. As they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me, and I will make sure that I am not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. It's possible to be filled with disbelief, joy, and wonder all at the same time. Don't think just because you have doubts that discredits you. They were in the presence of the risen Savior, filled with disbelief, doubt, joy, and wonder. What a beautiful combination. Then Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and then he ate it as they watched. I love that detail. They're standing there in disbelief. And Jesus' response isn't to explain the creation of the universe. Not to break down scientifically how he rose from the dead. Not to download the whole revelation of scripture. He asked them, do you have something to eat? And so they gave him something to eat, and the Bible says that they sat down and they watched him. They sat down and they watched him. I think that sums up the entirety of our faith. Watching Jesus, focused on Jesus, prioritizing Jesus, valuing Jesus. If there's only one thing you remember from anything I say today, it's these three words, focus on him. You know, Luke chapter 24 starts off with the women at the tomb. They go there to bring incense spices to anoint the body and they go there and you know this they find the stone rolled away and an angel says why are you seeking the living amongst the dead why are you seeking life in dead places why are you seeking new life in your old life why are you seeking the living amongst the dead And so these women, they run and go tell the other disciples because the angel told them to. Specifically, the angel says, go and tell the other men and Peter that Jesus is alive. And I find that interesting. Why add in specifically, go tell Peter? 
So the women, they go to the men and they reverse what happened in the Garden of Eden where the woman brought death to the man and now the women are going and bringing the word of life to the men. And the Bible says in verse 11 that they were confused and didn't believe. They thought that the testimony of these women was foolish. Followers of Jesus saw the miracles, were with him all throughout his earthly ministry, thought that the first proclamation of the gospel was foolish. They didn't believe. But in verse 12 of Luke chapter 24, it says, but Peter got up and ran to the tomb. But Peter ran to the tomb. It says that he peered in and then went home wondering, thinking, hoping, praying, wrestling. What a beautiful picture of what it means to search for Jesus. Are you humble enough to admit that you don't got everything figured out in life? Are you humble enough to admit when I've been the problem in my life? Peter is fresh off of denying Jesus. He's fresh off of sinning just like Judas. They both rejected him. And the angel says, go tell that guy the truth. And isn't it fascinating that all of the disciples had heard from Jesus before the cross ever happened that he would be betrayed, that he would be sentenced to die, and that he would rise again. Before the crucifixion, crucifixion ever happened, Jesus had already told them what was getting ready to go down. How quickly we forget. And I believe if me and you were there too, we would forget as well. It's easy to allow what you see to cause you to forget what you've heard. It's easy to allow what you see to cause you to forget what you've heard. These disciples, these followers of Jesus had just been through hell. They had just witnessed the man who they put their whole lives on the line for be betrayed, abused, mocked, humiliated, and executed. Seeing that with my eyes would cause me to forget too. But Peter ran when he heard that there's a chance There's a chance. Maybe, just maybe, he is the Messiah. Maybe, just maybe, he is who he said he is. Maybe, just maybe, he is going to do what he said he was going to do, even though it looks different than what we had hoped. And so, Peter goes back to the house not fully understanding what's happening. And then Jesus appears to these two disciples walking away from Jerusalem. It's funny, you've got two groups of disciples, some sitting in disbelief, one in the middle, do I believe, do I not believe, but I'm going to investigate it on my own. And then you've got these disciples walking away. Which group are you in? Some of you right now, prodigals, you've been walking away from a long time. Jesus is faithful to meet you. 
and bring you back home. Some of you are sitting here right now in dis disbelief and you think everything coming out of my mouth right now is foolish. That's okay. Jesus is going to show it for you too. And the reality is we're all in the middle on any given day. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know everything about this gospel thing. But I have hope. And I remember what he said, and I remember what was revealed to me. Because remember, Peter was the one who proclaimed, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Peter got the revelation. He knew he had a conviction. And isn't it funny that when they're all together, the two that were on the road to Emmaus, when they all come back, they're arguing basically about what is going on. And it says that suddenly Jesus is in their midst. And then it says they thought he was a ghost. They were filled with doubt, joy, and wonder, and they were afraid because they thought he was a ghost. And this wasn't the first time this happened. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus walked on water towards them. And Peter yelled out, I think it's a ghost. If that's you, Lord, tell me to walk on the water towards you. If you're not a ghost, tell me to walk on the water towards you. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong winds and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? So in Luke chapter 24, they're all gathered together and they see Jesus and they think he's a ghost. And this is the same thing that happened just in a different environment. A couple of chapters before, they're on a boat in a similar situation. I think Jesus is a ghost. So Peter, being the loud mouth that he is, says, if you're not a ghost, Lord, tell me to come towards you, and I'll do it. Peter walked on water. Peter sank. Peter proclaimed the truth about the revelation of who Jesus is, walked on water. Peter denied Jesus, Peter sank. Peter got it right and Peter got it wrong. You get it right and you get it wrong. Here's the truth. Walking on water is overrated. Walking on water is overrated. If we all went to the ocean right now and Jesus suddenly appeared and walked on water, raise your hand if you would be amazed. I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't. He's God. That's light work. He's the God of the universe, omnipotent, all powerful. There is nothing that your God cannot do. Miracles are just ordinary to God. They're mind blowing to us, but that's nothing to him. I spoke the whole world into existence. You think I can't walk on the very thing that I created? That big ball of burning gas billions of miles away that you can't even look at is just a shadow compared to my glory. The mountains, the stars, the galaxies, all of that is in his hands and you think that he can't walk on water? Who do you say that I am? 
If you think I'm just a good teacher, all right, I can see why you'd be surprised. But if you know who I am, God in the flesh, you would not put limits on me. If God created the universe and rose from the dead, what else is possible? But what's crazy to me isn't just Jesus walking on water. It's not even Peter walking on water because Peter didn't walk in water because of his faith. He walked on water because of his faith in action to obey what Jesus told him to do. You see, so many of us think that the Christian walk is about having the faith to do the impossible. Having the faith to see the breakthrough. Having the faith, in other words, to walk on water and you're missing the point. That's where Peter got wrong. How do I know? Because Jesus said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? He didn't say, why did you doubt that you could walk on water? Why did you doubt me? Because Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that's little. That's little. So why are you bashing him, Peter? God, why are you bashing Peter for having little faith when you said all we need is faith the size of a mustard seed? Because it's not about the size of your faith. It's about who your faith is in. Don't try to walk on water. It's overrated. Just stay focused on Jesus. Because here's the reality. Some days you're going to walk on water. But Jesus doesn't define you by your successes. Your righteousness, you at your best, you're like filthy rags. You think that God will bless you more when you get it right. He does not care about you walking on water. And on the flip side, he doesn't bash you when you sink. You're not defined by your highs and you're not defined by your lows. You're defined by screaming, save me. Save me. Don't let me go. I'm focused on you. So don't try to walk on water and don't allow the enemy to take you out when you do sink. Be steady and keep your eyes on him. Stay focused on him. Faith in Jesus is the solution to every single one of our problems. You don't like that answer. Faith in Jesus is the solution to every single one of our problems. It doesn't mean that you'll have understanding of your situation doesn't mean that everything will get resolved the way that you want it. But it does mean that you will be changed. God is more concerned about changing you, not your situation. How do we close the gap between our proclaimed values in our actual priorities? How do we close the gap between what we say and what we do? The Apostle Paul laid it out. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who can save me from me? And what is the answer that he gives us? Thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus. He doesn't give us a formula. He doesn't give us a blueprint because that would be the equivalent of you trying to walk on water. He says, have faith in Jesus. Have a real relationship with 
Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Value Jesus because who you spend time with is who you become. And as you become more Christ-like, not just on the outside, but your heart and your mind changes, you'll respond to your situations differently. So when you show up, it's no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you because you've been getting alone with him and allowing him to get in you. Faith in Jesus is the solution. And it's that simple that it goes over our heads. Do you really believe for you to be the spouse that you're called to be, you can do it in your own strength? We believe. Why do we not obey? It's simple. We think we got it. We believe that we can live life on our own terms. I can follow you, but not obey you. I can listen, but not believe. Business owners, you cannot be the business owner that you are called to be without the Holy Spirit. Parents, you cannot parent the way that you are called to parent without the Holy Spirit. We cannot live life as we ought to without Jesus in us. And that takes intentionality. In other words, that takes dying. Let's be honest. The majority of problems in our life is because we gave too much of ourselves. Like, let's pull up your resume and your track record. A lot of the dysfunction in your life. It's you did what you wanted. You did what you thought was best. You did what you thought was going to get you success. You thought what you, like, it's us all over our lives. And Jesus is like, how can I bless that? It's not surrender to me. It's one thing to surrender your plans to God. It's another thing entirely to go to him for the plan. As a father of three, I have a general love for like all kids. As a parent, We know what it takes to take care of a kid. But no one in this room can tell me anything about my kids. Like, I know what's special about kids, but I know specifically what's special about my kids. For God so loved the world, but do you believe that he loves and knows you. He knows what's special about humanity. He created us all in his image, but then he knows what's special about you. We just spent eight weeks learning God's plan for marriage. Okay, are you sitting with the Holy Spirit to get God's plan for your marriage? You learned principles on how God wired women to be men. Okay, Are you getting alone to listen to God about how he wired your wife? We learn principles on how God wired men to be, ladies. Are you getting alone with God to get his eyes to see how God wired your man to be? It's when you take these general principles and make them specific that you see the power unleashed in your life. So you're hearing this message right now. You'll read a chapter, but are you getting alone with the author of the chapter to say, what does this mean for me and for us? Because what's written in this Bible cannot mean to you what it didn't first mean to its original audience. God wants to be personal with you. The disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us? Do you know the greatest thing to me that testifies 
to the existence of God and that Jesus is who he says he is? It's simply that when I hear his voice, something in me comes alive. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep know me. They know my voice. As his people, when he speaks to you, are you listening? Are your ears open? Truth and facts are not the same thing. Some of us are so intellectual and it's a beautiful thing. God wants us to love him, love him with our minds. But even our minds need to be submitted to God because it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Can we pull that up? Luke chapter 24, verse 44. It says, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Do you realize that when you open up this Bible, he doesn't just leave you to figure it out on your own? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you want to please God, you need to first believe that he exists and then sincerely seek him. Sincerely seek him. What does it mean to sincerely seek God? You have to be open. You have to be humble enough to run to the tomb in your doubt and disbelief and say, maybe there's something here. Jesus, I don't know what all of this stuff is about, but maybe there's something here. So let me be open to it. So many of us are looking for the Bible to prove itself. We're looking for God to prove himself. God isn't afraid of you wrestling with him, but don't forget who you're wrestling with. A lot of us, honestly, we're asking questions of the Bible that the Bible isn't trying to answer. God is not trying to prove his existence. He just is, regardless of how we feel about it. Thomas, one of the other disciples, doubted because he wasn't there when Jesus showed up and ate. And I love that he ate because he proved that he wasn't a ghost. Because other heresies would rise up in church history saying that, oh, Jesus didn't really rise up in bodily form. He was just a spirit or people hallucinated it. No, we saw him eat. We touched his wounds. We embraced him. He really rose. We're testifying the truth of what we experienced. In other words, we taste and we saw. We experienced him for ourselves. Thomas wasn't there to have that experience. So he doubted. And church history for 2,000 years has been bashing him for doubting. You would probably doubt too. And you know what's crazy is he wasn't the only one doubting, but he gets the label doubting Thomas. But you know what I love about Thomas? He doubted, but he was still in the house. He doubted in community. Let me say this clearly. Your doubts are welcomed here. Jesus doesn't bash you for doubting. And if you're humble enough to stay and wrestle in your doubts, you'll get a deeper revelation where Jesus showed up in a different timing. So you can't compare your experience to somebody else's experience. We're all in our own journey. Same Jesus, different experiences. He shows up, reveals himself. And he worships him and believes. And Jesus responds so beautifully. You believe because you saw but blessed are those that believe who will never see. Church, one day your faith will be sight. Jesus is coming back for his church. And in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus says this, When I do return, who on the earth will I find with faith? Faith in action. Who on the earth will I find living life on mission, on purpose, in relationship with me? 
obeying me, living in community. Because community blesses God. Luke chapter 24, it ends, and worship team, you can come up. It ends with Jesus ascending, and the disciples are there. They get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they go out and proclaim the gospel. Jesus says, don't do anything. Wait for me. Wait for me. Are you waiting on God? Are you waiting? Are you humble enough to wait? Are you hungry enough to wait? Or are you quick to get up and do your own thing? Quick to go and try to walk on water? Let me know how that works out. And it says that they went away praising and blessing God. They watched Jesus ascend. They leave later get filled, and then it simply says that they went on meeting in the temple, praising and blessing God. And the question that I have is, how do you bless God? We're so focused on God blessing us, but what does it mean for us to bless God? What can you do for the one who doesn't need anything? The Bible says that unity commands a blessing. To be blessed is deeper than just having your needs met. Blessing simply means pleasure, joy, happiness. So when you're blessed, you, you get joy. What gives God joy? His family together. In your doubt, in your unbelief in your worries, in your frustrations, in your wonder, in your joy, all the emotions. We're human. We're flawed. We're family. We're a community. Common unity. The common thing that unites us is Jesus. He doesn't define us by our successes and he doesn't define us by our failures. We're called to simply focus on him. Church, I want to invite us to stand. I'm glad that we're going into this next series talking about practicing the way because Christianity is meant to be lived, not just learned. How many of us learned how to ride a bike by taking a test? No, you got out there and you worked it. It's the same thing with our faith. We're not called to just sit and listen about riding a bike. Get out there and start working it out. Yeah, you'll fall. Yeah, you'll get distracted. Yeah, you'll be wobbly. Yeah, you'll fall and get scraped. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. So stop trying to make sense of everything. Stop trying to understand everything. Because facts don't tell the whole story of truth. Facts never change somebody's heart. Look at Thomas. They told him the facts of what happened. It wasn't until he had an encounter with truth that his heart changed. Many are the plans in a man's heart. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. I pray that God's purpose prevails in your life. That you surrender to him that you bless God by really leaning into community. It's one thing to sign up for a crew. It's another thing to be vulnerable and open yourself up to doing life with other people. It's one thing to listen. It's another thing to receive and wrestle. I pray you do get offended because that means that you're rubbing up against other people that are challenging you, sharpening you, changing you if nothing changes nothing changes church the greatest gift that God gives us other than himself is community so sign up for a crew go to the bookstore get that book open up the book and ask the Holy Spirit meet me in this moment you're the author of this book so open up my mind and my heart because I want you to burn within me 
I refuse to keep showing up in my life full of myself. I need to show up with the fruit of the Spirit evident in my life. And that only comes from a real relationship with Jesus Christ. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made the conscious decision to repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, the God of the universe, your creator, the only one who knows you fully and accepts you completely. He doesn't just love you, he accepts you and loves you too much to keep you that way. Surrender your life to him. Allow him to open up your heart, to open up your mind, to open up your life so that way he can bless you. He is a good God, a good father who wants to bless his kids. He knows everything you need and more. Just turn to him. It's an everyday decision to die to yourself and walk in the fullness of life that only he can provide. So if that's you, church, I want to invite us to all pray in this moment. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I need you. Meet me here. Soften my heart. Open my mind. Clear the fog from my eyes and help me to be the person that you wish for me to be, that you will for me to be, who you died for me to be, who you raised to life for me to be. I need you more than I know. So help me and do what only you can do. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you made that prayer, yeah, we can give it up. If you made that decision and prayed that prayer, the journey begins. He's already been doing the work. Some of you have just been asleep for a long time. So the altar is open, and we would love to pray with you specifically about that situation. We have a Next Steps team out in the lobby in a room. We would love to have a conversation with you, pray with you, so that way you can get the blueprint, the game plan for God's will for your life. So I pray that you leave here knowing that Jesus is on the throne. He is faithful. He is good. And his hand of protection, blessing, and provision is on your life. Church, we love you. Have a great week.